Chapter 105. Does the whale's magnitude diminish? Will he perish? Inasmuch then as this leviathan comes floundering down upon us from the headwaters of the eternities, it may be fitly inquired whether in the long course of his generations he has not degenerated from the original bulk of his sires. But upon investigation we find that not only are the whales of the present day superior in magnitude to those whose fossil remains are found in the tertiary system, embracing a distinct geological period prior to man, but that the whales found in that tertiary system, those belonging to its latter formations, exceed in size those of its earlier ones. Of all the pre-Adamite whales yet exhumed, by far the largest is the Alabama one mentioned in the last chapter, and that was less than 70 feet in length in the skeleton, whereas we have already seen that the tape measure gives 72 feet for the skeleton of a large-sized modern whale, and I have heard on whalemen's authority that sperm whales have been captured near a hundred feet long at the time of capture. But may it not be that while the whales of the present hour are an advance in magnitude upon those of all previous geological periods, may it not be that since Adam's time they have degenerated? Assuredly we must conclude so if we are to credit the accounts of such gentlemen as Pliny and the ancient naturalists generally. For Pliny tells us of whales that embraced acres of living bulk, and Aldrovandus of others which measured 800 feet in length, rope walks and Thames tunnels of whales, and even in the days of Banks and Solander, Cook's naturalists, we find a Danish member of the Academy of Sciences setting down certain Iceland whales, Raiden Siskur, or wrinkled bellies, at 120 yards, that is 360 feet, and Lassipede, the French naturalist in his elaborate history of whales, in the very beginning of his work, page 3, sets down the right whale at 100 meters, 328 feet, and this work was published so late as A.D. 1825. But will any whaleman believe these stories? No, the whale of today is as big as his ancestors in Pliny's time, and if ever I go where Pliny is, I, a whaleman, more than he was, will make bold to tell him so, because I cannot understand how it is that while the Egyptian mummies that were buried thousands of years before even Pliny was born do not measure so much in their coffins as a modern Kentuckian in his socks. And while the cattle and other animals sculptured on the oldest Egyptian and Nineveh tablets, by the relative proportions in which they are drawn, just as plainly prove that the high-bred, stall-fed, prized cattle of Smithfield not only equal but far exceed in magnitude the fattest of Pharaoh's fat kine. In the face of all this, I will not admit that of all animals the whale alone should have degenerated." But still another inquiry remains, one often agitated by the more recondite Nantucketers, whether owing to the almost omniscient lookouts of the mastheads of the whale ships, now penetrating even through Bering Straits, and into the remotest secret drawers and lockers of the world, and the thousand harpoons and lances darted along all continental coasts, the moot point is whether Leviathan can long endure so wide a chase and so remorseless a havoc whether he must not at last be exterminated from the waters, and the last whale, like the last man, smoke his last pipe, and then himself evaporate in the final puff. Comparing the humped herds of whales with the humped herds of buffalo, which not forty years ago overspread by tens of thousands the prairies of Illinois and Missouri, and shook their iron manes and scowled with their thunder-clotted brows upon the sights of populous river capitals, where now the polite broker sells you land at a dollar an inch, in such a comparison an irresistible argument would seem furnished, to show that the hunted whale cannot now escape speedy extinction. But you must look at this matter in every light, for though so short a period ago, not a good lifetime, the census of the buffalo in Illinois exceeded the census of men now in London, and though at the present day not one horn or hoof of them remains in all that region, and though the cause of this wondrous extermination was the spear of man, yet the far different nature of the whale hunt peremptorily forbids so inglorious an end to the leviathan. Forty men in one ship hunting the sperm whales for forty-eight months think they have done extremely well, and thank God if at last they carry home the oil of forty fish. Whereas in the days of the old Canadian and Indian hunters and trappers of the West, when the far west, in whose sunset sun still rise, was a wilderness and a virgin, the same number of moccasined men and the same number of months, mounted on horse instead of sailing in ships, would have slain not forty, but forty thousand and more buffaloes, a fact that, if need were, could be statistically stated. 
nor considered aright does it seem any argument in favor of the gradual extinction of the sperm whale. For example, that in former years, the latter part of the last century, say, these leviathans, in small pods, were encountered much oftener than at present, and in consequence the voyages were not so prolonged, and were also much more remunerative. Because, as has been elsewhere noticed, those whales, influenced by some views to safety, now swim the seas in immense caravans, so that to a large degree the scattered solitaries, yokes and pods and schools of other days are now aggregated into vast but widely separated, unfrequent armies. That is all, and equally fallacious seems the conceit that because the so-called whalebone whales no longer haunt many grounds in former years abounding with them, hence that species also is declining. For they were only being driven from promontory to cape, and if one coast is no longer enlivened with their jets, then be sure some other and remoter strand has been very recently startled by the unfamiliar spectacle. Furthermore, concerning these last-mentioned leviathans, they have two firm fortresses, which in all human probability will forever remain impregnable. And as upon the invasion of their valleys, the frosty Swiss have retreated to their mountains. So, hunted from the savannas and glades of the Middle Seas, the whalebone whales can at last resort to their polar citadels, and diving under the ultimate glassy barriers and walls there, come up among icy fields and flows, and in a charmed circle of everlasting December, bid defiance to all pursuit from man. But as perhaps fifty of these whalebone whales are harpooned for one cachalot, some philosophers of the forecastle have concluded that this positive havoc has already very seriously diminished their battalions. But though for some time past the number of these whales, not less than thirteen thousand, have been annually slain on the Norwest coast by the Americans alone, yet there are considerations which render even this circumstance of little or no account as an opposing argument in this matter. Natural as it is to be somewhat incredulous concerning the populousness of the more enormous creatures of the globe, yet what shall we say to Harto, the historian of Goa, when he tells us that at one hunting the king of Siam took four thousand elephants, that in those regions elephants are numerous as droves of cattle in the temperate climes, and there seems no reason to doubt that if these elephants, which have now been hunted for thousands of years, by Semiramis, by Portu, by Hannibal, and by all the successive monarchs of the East, if they still survive there in great numbers, much more may the great whale outlast all hunting, since he has a pasture to expatiate in, which is precisely twice as large as all Asia, both Americas, Europe and Africa, New Holland, and all the isles of the sea combined. Moreover, we are to consider that from the presumed great longevity of the whales, they are probably attaining the age of a century and more. Therefore, at any one period of time, several distinct adult generations must be contemporary. And what that is, we may soon gain some idea of, by imagining all the graveyards, cemeteries, and family vaults of creation, yielding up the live bodies of all the men, women, and children who were alive 75 years ago, and adding this countless host to the present human population of the globe. Wherefore, for all these things, we account the whale immortal in his species, however perishable in his individuality. He swam the seas before the continents broke water, and once swam over the site of the Tuileries and Windsor Castle and the Kremlin. In Noah's flood he despised Noah's ark, and if ever the world is to be again flooded, like the Netherlands, to kill off its rats, then the eternal whale will still survive, and rearing upon the topmost crest of the equatorial flood, spout his froth defiance to the skies. End of chapter 105